Okay, so in this video, I'll be solving example 3.3, where I'll look at a rocket that's launched vertically. And this example goes along with subsection 3.5, which was the momentum equation for a control volume with rectilinear acceleration. So what we'll be doing then is essentially a force balance on this rocket. And the rocket itself will define as our control volume, and then that is accelerating as it's launched. So it's a force balance for a, an accelerating control volume. So neglecting air resistance, what speed would a vertically directed rocket attain after it burns for five seconds if it starts from rest, has initial mass of 350 kilograms, burns its mass at 10 kilograms per second, and ejects gas at an atmospheric pressure with a speed of 2,500 meters per second relative to the rocket? Plot the rocket speed as a function of time for the first minute of flight if it consumes all of its fuel after five seconds. So to figure out how we solve this, let's first look at what exactly they're asking us. So it's asking what speed would the rocket attain if it burns for five seconds and starts from rest. So speed. So we need to figure out its speed. And then finally, we have to plot its speed. So we'll start by drawing out our figure which is actually done for us at the right. I'll outline our control volume here. So we know there are a number of different forces acting on this rocket. We've got its one control surface here. So we'll have to consider that. And then we also have the weight of the rocket. So to find out the speed after these five seconds, we're gonna need the acceleration. So we know this is an accelerating control volume. So we use the equation we just derived. So that's the momentum equation in the y direction for an accelerating reference frame. So I'll write that whole thing out here, then we'll go through it term by term. All right, so I'm gonna label each of these terms in the equation and then write out our assumptions explicitly. Okay, so pretty much everything there is given. Number one and two are very explicitly given. Number three, it tells us the gas is ejected at 2,500 meters per second. So again, it doesn't specify any variation across the surface or with time. So we assume it's uniform flow. It also says it burns at 10 kilograms per second. So we'll assume again a constant mass flow rate. Now, what do these mean for each of our terms? I'm going to walk through these one by one here. A, so do we have any surface forces in the y direction here? Surface forces are the ones that are either gonna be the shear or the normal. So that's gonna be friction or pressure. We're told there's no air resistance. We're told the pressure's atmospheric everywhere, including across the exit point there. Means all our surface forces have to be zero. Okay, term B, what are our body forces? We've seen this a few times now, so that'll be gravity. So our gravity's mg, so we write that out here. Negative, because it's acting downwards compared to the positive y direction. Capital MCV is denoting total mass of our control volume. Okay, term C, we look at very closely there. So we're integrating over our control volume the acceleration and the density. So we don't anticipate any change of acceleration or density across the volume itself, so we pull those out of the integral and we write it like this. Okay, now term D, so what exactly is going on with term D here? Okay, so what is this term exactly? So it's di by di t, and so it's a time rate of change, and then the integral, basically it's the y momentum of the fluid located in the control volume relative to the control volume itself. Okay, so let's break this one down and really try to think it through. So of all the mass in the rocket, we have a whole bunch of unburned fuel, the rocket structure itself, and anything within the rocket. So I mean, generally all the passengers, all the cargo, all that strapped down securely to the rocket frames. So none of that stuff has any velocity relative to the reference frame. It's all moving at exactly the same velocity as the control volume. So none of that would have any y momentum relative to, to the control volume since it's moving at exactly the same velocity. But we do have some of the gases in the nozzle, for example, 
as they accelerate out of the exit point there, maybe right here, that'd be moving pretty quickly. So they might have a high Y momentum value relative to the control volume. So it's really important for us to remember exactly what this term is saying though. It's saying the time rate of change of the Y momentum. So even though some of these gases, as they exit right through the nozzle region there, are moving very quickly, they might have a high Y momentum value, we still only account for them if they change with time because of that partial derivative out front. So then we ask the question, so do we expect these gases that are exiting the rocket do we expect their Y momentum to change in time? So for example, do we expect their velocity to change? Well, no, not really based on we're give, what we're given, right? We're just, uh, it just says it has a speed of 2,500 meters per second. Doesn't say that that changes with time. So we assume that's relatively constant. So therefore we don't really expect that Y momentum of all that fluid to be changing over time. So we set this term, in this case, it's approximately equal to zero and we can neglect it. And we see in this example here how important it is to have a physical understanding of what this term really is. See how it makes our life a lot easier in actually applying and completing these calculations in practice. Now it's worth considering for a second, like when, when would this term actually matter, right? So if we probe this a little bit, we notice that if we have a Y momentum of the fluid in the control volume, relative to the control volume, that means all the stuff inside this rocket would have to be moving with a velocity that's different than the rocket structure itself. So for example, if you had a whole bunch of stuff on this rocket that was moving around or people moving around very dramatically and they were changing their velocity with respect to time in the Y direction, so shifting themselves from the front to the rear of the rocket with very high accelerations. Now in that case, we might have to account for some of that momentum change. They'd have to be accelerating pretty quickly for, for these numbers to start to add up so that they could compete with the momentum that's exiting out the back of the rocket. But, you know, in other types of examples, that's something we, we might have to consider, right? So really make sure we're understanding the physical meaning of that term there. When we say time rate of change of Y momentum of the fluid in the control volume relative to the control volume. Alrighty, final term, term E there, integrating across the control surface. Okay, now this is all the momentum that's exiting out the rear of the rocket. So we know essentially this is what is causing the acceleration of the rocket, right? So that's definitely not zero. So we go ahead and sub in here. And again, we'll see there's a bit of a shortcut we can take if we recognize the physical meaning of these terms. So V with the lowercase x, y, z subscript there, that's the y velocity of the fluid crossing the boundary relative to the control volumes reference frame. Now that's in the downwards direction, so we'll write that as negative VE. And that matches the labeling in our figure there too. Now what's left in this control surface integral here, when we go ahead and do the dot product, the velocity vectors pointing outwards and the area vectors pointing outwards, so we end up with the positive term. So we can then just write VXYZ times DA there. And the rho VDA, we've seen that come up quite a few times. So I'll give you a quick second here. Again, pause it if you want to figure it out. Make sure you can figure out what that term is. That's really important here. Okay, so we've seen a few different ways to figure that out. I've, I plugged in units there, but also we can look, we can remember that a velocity times an area is a volumetric flow rate, and then a volumetric flow rate times a density gives us what? A mass flow rate, right? So I'll scroll down and give myself some more room to write here. So that term is just saying the mass flow rate across our exit there. So as we mentioned above, it's all expected to be uniform. There's nothing that indicates that we have any change across the area. So we write that then as just negative VE times M dot. All right, so that's the momentum that's exiting the rocket from the bottom. Go ahead and sub all that in. Okay, now that's not too bad at all. We can solve that pretty easily. So we remember what we need is the acceleration of the rocket. So in this case, that A, R, F, Y term, that's the acceleration of the reference frame in the Y direction, where the reference frame is our control volume, which is our rocket, right? So I'll rearrange for A, R, F, Y. All right, so that's our expression for the acceleration. Now we've done this type of analysis before many times where we need to calculate a velocity from an acceleration. Would have done this earlier in our physics classes, for example. So to get the velocity, we remember that our acceleration is really just the time rate of change of our velocity. So let's sub that in. 
then we have to separate and integrate. Now to solve this, we have to integrate, but we will remember here that to integrate this properly, we have to make sure these terms inside our integration expression here will not be a function of the variable that we're integrating over. So we'll look at the right hand side to see if we have any issues. Are any of these values a function of time? Well, VE and M dot E, those were given above and don't vary with time. Gravity, nope, that's a constant. But MCV, the total mass of the control volume, well, we're told we're burning this fuel. This fuel's exiting out the back, so we definitely have the mass of our control volume changing with time. Okay, so before we can integrate, we have to figure out exactly what's the expression of how the control volume mass varies with time. So we get our time functionality in there. We have to have it before we can integrate. So I'll do this step by step. Some students, oftentimes, they can just see this. They'll see how the mass of the control volume changes with time. But I'm going to do it step by step just so it's really clear here. So to determine how our mass changes with time, of course, it's the mass conservation equation that we'd be looking at because we want to do a mass balance and we have our control volume here. So let me sub in. Alrighty, now again, we're going to see the importance of understanding the physical meaning of these terms, right? So the term on the left there is saying the time rate of change of the rho dv integral across our whole control volume. So we remember now that's just the total mass of our control volume. And the term on the right here, yet again, we're seeing rho v dot dA, which a number of times we'd figured out is our mass flow rate across that control surface, right? Okay, so we sub in now. And again, many, that's fairly intuitive, right? We're just saying, you know, how much the control volume mass changes with time is exactly equal to how much mass is exiting out the bottom. I mean, that's, that's completely intuitive. Many students recognize that right away, just skip straight to that equation. That's totally fine. I'm just doing all the steps to be perfectly clear here. So then we separate and integrate this expression. And we just notice the limits of integration. So I'm starting at the initial time so that m sub 0 is our initial mass. It goes from time 0 to t. So that saves me from doing the constants in a separate step, but integrate however, however you're more comfortable with. So when we integrate that, we end up with this expression here. Okay, like I said, if you want to jump ahead to that right at the beginning, that's fine with me. Just make sure you know what's going on here. So basically saying the mass of the control volume equals whatever our initial mass is, m naught, minus the mass flow rate exiting times our time. So now I have the mass of the control volume as a function of time. I can sub that into the integration we wanted to complete for velocity above, and now we're capable of integrating. So I'll write that here. So that's our integration there. Again, just a quick note, I generally use integration tables for things like this, but some people have the basic integrals memorized or just uh, go ahead and look at an integral table there to figure out exactly why that integration is the logarithmic function there. Okay, so that's the velocity of our control volume as a function of time. Everything on the right-hand side of the equation is given. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sub right in. All right, so that's our value. It's positive, meaning it's pointing upwards. 336 meters per second. We might think of that as being really fast, but again, it's a rocket we're dealing with, so probably makes sense. Now we're asked to plot it, so I've done that below using Excel. This expression we've derived here, I'll scroll back up to the question. So we remember it burns this fuel for five seconds, and it says it consumes all of its fuel after the five second burn. But we're asked to plot this for the first minute of flight. So basically what we've derived here, that's valid for when it's burning its fuel for the first five seconds. So to find the velocity after those five seconds, we can do another quick balance below here. I'll scroll back down. So after five seconds, all we have is acceleration due to gravity. So we know the acceleration of the rocket now is just negative G. So I'll sub in for acceleration, separate and integrate.
It's really important to notice these integration bounds here. So this is starting after the five second mark. So make sure you integrate from the velocity at five seconds and from time at five seconds. Okay, so we do the integration. All right, now I plotted this. I think it's pretty cool for us to take a look at this rocket velocity here. Okay, so we use the velocity expression above for the first five seconds. So we see the velocity increasing as it accelerates until it hits that 336 meters per second. Now it's decelerating, but it's important to notice this thing keeps going upwards until it reaches about the 40 second mark. So the velocity is still in the positive direction at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, doesn't actually start to head downwards until the 40 second mark where its velocity hits zero. And after that point, it starts to fall. Okay, so pretty cool analysis, interesting problem. We now know exactly how we can calculate the acceleration of rockets just based purely on a momentum balance. And again, we see the importance of the mass of the gases exiting the bottom of the rocket. So that's actually propelling the rocket upwards. So great example of fluid forces there in action. And remember again, just how important it is to have these mathematical expressions and make sure you understand the physical meaning of each of those terms. Bye-bye.